Hello, everyone, and welcome back to English 1110. This is Case Wizzle checking in for week three of the semester already. I can't believe how quickly things already are moving. This, of course, is your in-depth lecture that takes you through kind of the concepts and themes that we're talking about this week, whereas your overview lecture is designed to kind of guide you through, you know, what's due, what do I need to complete? Um, and this is going to be really kind of the time each week that we get together to talk about what are the um, concepts, the themes, kind of the takeaways, if you will, that you want to emerge with a comprehension of for the semester. Um, you may be occasionally tempted or routinely tested or tempted, I don't know, um, to kind of skip through these lectures or not pay a lot of attention to them. But I do want to remind you that this course is designed in a scaffolded way, which means that what we do with the kind of process posts and the discussion board posts in the foundations work section of the syllabus is designed to kind of build towards um, your core assignments, right? And so when we are doing these exercises of applying concepts or talking through themes, the expectation here is that you are comprehending these things that you can apply them in kind of a, um, like lower stakes exercise of foundations work, and then eventually return to these techniques and utilize them in assignments that count for quite a few points. So I encourage you to really be attentive to weekly lectures. I know that it is a summer semester and so it might be challenging at times to like want to do that labor, um, but I do wanna really implore you to do it, namely because I have found that students who are really kind of careful and attentive to the materials throughout the semester, have a lot of an easier time with the final project, with the essays, because you're kind of learning it in pieces rather than trying to stomach it all in one go, okay? So with that advice being said, let's go ahead and dive into this week's in-depth lecture. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and as I kind of mentioned in the overview lecture, we're talking about surveillance capitalism this week. Um, we're definitely diving into some kind of lengthier readings this go around. But what I've titled this lecture for you um, with is an individual in the system. And that's going to really be the anchor for what we're talking through this week with these um, music videos, with the readings. I want you to really be reflecting on and thinking about how does an individual fit within a larger system? As we'll talk about this semester, that system could be comprised of you know, capitalism, it could be comprised of a social institution, um, it could be comprised of social media or popular culture, but we really want to be thoughtful about how an individual person or an individual part fits into a larger whole and how that larger whole um, kind of creates and narrates in some sense an expectation or series of expectations or roles for the individual that they feel com kind of compelled to comply with, um, which emerges with kind of this then expectation of, you know, what is normal, what is conventional, what is expected, what is accepted. And those kinds of social pressures then get pushed onto an individual person that they either knowingly or unknowingly feel that pressure to have to live up to the expectations of the system. So this is the in-depth lecture for week three of the semester, which is May 23rd to May 29th. And what we're going to be talking about today are as follows. So we're going to review the music videos from Britney Spears, the 1975, Katy Perry, Halsey, and Madison Beer. We're going to review Gia Tolentino's article, The Age of Instagram Face. We'll review Shoshana Zuboff's chapter from The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And we'll discuss concepts related to US popular culture and Americanness that can be applied to your close readings of the music videos and article. I want to flag that I have organized the slide in such a way that each of these bullet points are hyperlinked which means that you can click on them and you'll be redirected to that section of the Google Sites immediately. I found that this technique can be helpful on kind of lengthier lectures, but also in sessions that we're focusing on concepts, I want you to be able to move around the lecture um, in a really kind of um, easy way, especially as you perhaps return to these slides when you're doing a more assignment. This of course does not mean that you should only prioritize one section over another, but my hope is that the hyperlinks help you to be able to use these slides in ways that are useful to you. Um, this is a lengthy lecture, so I do encourage you to take breaks, to get a snack, to stretch, um, to watch this lecture in parts if that's helpful to you. Again, as I mentioned last week, some students like to watch lectures um, across multiple days. Other students like to just sit down and do it in one go. Other students watch a lecture in multiple parts across one day. Whatever format is most comfortable for you, do that, but make sure that you really are paying attention to these lectures because they are meant to help guide you through the material, okay? So let's go ahead and get started on our first section, which is popular culture portrayals of celebrity, visibility, and public space. 
Now, one of the music videos that I assigned for you this week was from Britney Spears. Um, and as I mentioned in my previous lecture, and I'll kind of return to Britney Spears throughout the semester, Britney Spears, of course, is a really prominent pop culture icon. Um, she's very much synonymous with the 2000s and the 2010s in terms of people being really familiar with her kind of from the 90s onwards, but we really see a peak um, of kind of her public visibility in the 2000s in terms of her interactions with paparazzi, um, kind of the publicity that surrounds her interactions with her family around kind of her conservatorship and whether or not she's allowed to be in control of herself. And so there's kind of at this point in time of 2021, right, there's a lot of kind of public discourse and just attention surrounding Britney Spears and kind of the potential that she does or does not have control over her own life, right? But when Britney Spears initially comes onto the scene, she is kind of this beacon of, you know, a pop culture icon who's able to kind of, um, in some ways, move between this kind of virgin whore complex that we see for women. Um, and I'll talk about this again, of course, in a later lecture, but for Britney Spears, we see her as one who's sort of able to um, blend together what we see as the two options for women in pop culture, particularly white women, right? Um, that kind of option of either being virginal or being sort of pure, um, family friendly, being someone who's sort of angelic, if you will. We can kind of see that almost happening with her um, costuming here on the red carpet. And then we also see her in her public performances, um, kind of shocking parents because while her public image is one, that is being kind of represented as being virginal or pure. She's also kind of embracing the other side of that kind of dichotomy of the virgin whore complex and that she's sort of sexually liberated. She sings kind of cheekily about sex and sexual pleasure. And those two dynamics of her public persona really immediately, much like with Christina Aguilera, um, immediately make Britney Spears kind of this figure who is polarizing, but at the same time is really embraced by a lot of young female consumers. Now, the music video I gave you for today is Lucky, which is the second single from her 2000 album, Oops, I Did It Again. Very iconic, of course. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to kind of offer this music video in this week that we're talking about surveillance capitalism is, you know, in some respects, it's very difficult to watch this particular music video with the knowledge we have now about Britney Spears is just kind of ups and downs of her personal life um, and not recognize that there are certain kinds of messages here and just kind of lyrics in particular that are really exploring the dynamic of a celebrity who supposedly has everything while at the same time their perhaps public persona doesn't match how they're feeling internally. And as you watched this music video, I hope that you kind of reflected on that kind of tension we see with Britney Spears, um, and especially as she's kind of talking about this character or figure named Lucky. Now, as I mentioned in past lectures, I encourage you to watch lectures multiple times over, or lectures, um, music videos, I mean. Um, if you wanna watch lectures multiple times over, go for it. But I encourage you to watch music videos multiple times over um, because you're going to likely pick up on different cues each time that you watch it. Now with this one, after we kind of talk through the readings and talk through the concepts um, that you'll need to kind of go through process post number one, I really encourage you to reflect on the relationship between kind of this Brittany that we get here um, of narrator and this character Lucky, or if you perhaps read of both of them as Lucky, um, all interpretations are welcome. I'm very interested to hear, but I would really like you to pay attention to the settings that you're getting here. Um, kind of contemplate how this version of Lucky or Brittany is kind of interacting with other people, interacting with the setting. And especially when we understand that lyrically she's exploring this tension of kind of seemingly having it all. Um, how is this music video reflecting on the public's role in kind of the creation of this lucky figure? Um, and kind of what does it mean to be a star and to be kind of this public commodity in some ways where kind of everybody wants to know you, see you, kind of know your business, right? Um, but how does this video and this song kind of perhaps recognize that duality of kind of the, the actual person and then the star persona. Um, and so when we think then about kind of surveillance in particular, we want to really question how is Britney Spears and her creative team exploring this kind of dimension of celebrity um, in which you're sort of publicly visible, but also there's parts of you that are not visible at the same time, okay? Another um, kind of artist that you look at for this week is the 1975, and they're a British pop rock band. Um, they're from Manchester. 
um, or based out of Manchester presently, I should say. Um, and so they're not a US based artist. Um, the 1975, we have a music video titled The Sound, which is a single from their 2016 album, I Like It When You Sleep, for you are so beautiful yet so unaware of it. Um, this is arguably one of the 1975's probably more recognizable and bigger songs that they have. Um, I would really encourage you here to kind of in returning to this music video, really reflect on the significance of this kind of very minimal setting that we have. Um, we have sort of this large glass box or cube that we see the band performing in. Um, and I would encourage you to kind of consider the lighting changes, um, kind of the minimalist design of the setting, right? Um, who is appearing where at what times? What kinds of changes are we having? But also, you know, how is the music video perhaps extending or adding on to the messaging of the song um, through visual details that we get on screen, some of which are verbal, some of which are visual, um, and just really contemplate, right, what could be the symbolism? This is a music video that, you know, whereas with Britney Spears, we're kind of getting a narrative that's almost one for one with the lyrics, meaning that we have, you know, kind of a very literal interpretation of what the lyrics are telling us, kind of like the Carrie Underwood or the Toby Keith. Here we have a music video that's a bit more invested in symbolism. And so I would encourage you to consider sort of what does the band represent? What do the people in white represent? What could the cube represent? And so on and so forth, okay? <laughs> All right, then you had a music video from Katy Perry. Um, Katy Perry, of course, is an artist that a lot of folks are familiar with in terms of her music often being played on top radio, um, whereas with the 1975, we have a little bit more of them kind of being, um, I guess, visible in alternative spaces, I would argue, um, though they did kind of in, in experience a little bit of kind of mainstream recognition when celebrities like Taylor Swift started to kind of vocalize their um, love for the 1975's music. But with Katy Perry, we have sort of this consistently mainstream artist, much like Britney Spears. Um, Katy Perry has been a polarizing figure in that across the 2010s, we often see her music videos being accused of cultural appropriation, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. Um, she's, of course, now presently a judge on American Idol, um, but she is one who's kind of talked quite a bit about um, her growing up as a Christian and wasn't allowed to kind of listen to secular music. And now, of course, her brand is very much um, kind of steeped in shock value, steeped in kind of um, doing a lot of gimmicky type approaches to her music. Um, which is kind of in some respects intact here with Chain to the Rhythm, which was the lead single from her 2017 album, Witness. However, this album kind of deviates a bit for her um, from some of the other work that she put out, right? Like it definitely has sort of some of the same, I suppose, whimsical or just kind of futuristic energy that she brings to other texts of kind of this period. Um, but we also see her kind of providing us with a different sort of approach and that she's really concentrating on a social commentary. Um, across the music videos for this week, you've got artists who are putting forth a social commentary in their music video projects that kind of extend or complicate what we initially get from the song lyrics themselves, right? And so here I would implore you to really pay attention to costuming, really pay attention to the setting. Where is this entire music video taking place? Um, how are the extra extras kind of on display here in a really meaningful and diverse way? Um, how are some of the props organized around Katy Perry's body or organized around some of the um, extras that we have? There's also a lot of symmetry here. If we think back to the Donnie Trumpet and the Social Experiment video for Sunday Candy, where we had a lot of choreography and kind of people moving um, in synchronous movements throughout the video, we also see some synchronicity here as well as moments of deviation and kind of pulling away from the synchronous group. And so I would encourage you to pay attention to, you know, as you're kind of returning to this music video, are there moments that Katy Perry is perhaps signaling a change or a waking up or kind of a pivoting away from kind of the social order perhaps of the space that she's in, right? What could the setting that she is uh, placing herself in perhaps symbolize or represent beyond the literal translation of that location itself, okay? You also have a music video from Halsey. Halsey, of course, is someone who has consistently become very popular in top radio as well. Um, Halsey is someone who, especially with her latest project, Manic, talks quite a bit about bipolar disorder and talks kind of about her mental health and just sort of how she um, kind of mentally reflects on how her brain works and how kind of her um, various life experiences factor into kind of her memoir style 
music. Um, and she's very forthright in kind of connecting those lyrics also to poetry and other mediums. And she oftentimes in live performances will kind of translate her songs into kind of um, dance performances that usually are oftentimes happening with one other person. And we definitely see that at work here with Graveyard, which is the lead single from her 2020 album, Manic. Now, of course, um, with 2020 being what it was, um, some singles that were released during this point either got a lot of attention um, or just kind of went under the radar. Um, this was one that definitely, you know, since we have Sydney Sweeney in this, um, who's from Euphoria, there were a lot of um, kind of folks who consumed this video and kind of said there was a likeness between this and, and especially Euphoria, a specific episode, um, which if you've watched Euphoria, you know what I'm talking about. But this is one that, you know, there is some connectivity to the Katy Perry in that the landscape or setting is not all that different. So I would encourage you to kind of reflect on that a little bit of what might be the usefulness of this particular setting in terms of the lyrical explorations of Halsey. I would also, also encourage you to consider, um, given that this larger project of Manic is about kind of Halsey reflecting on and engaging with her experiences with bipolar disorder and mental health, um, how she is perhaps interpreting some of these themes or topics in this individual song, um, and just kind of in this project, you know, more broadly, how is she interpreting or translating those things through lighting, um, through sound, through dance, right? Definitely choreography is kind of a central component of how Halsey really um, presents her projects to the public. I would encourage you to think about, you know, kind of costuming and how that might factor in, but color is incredibly important with this music video. Um, I encourage you to kind of rewatch it and just kind of think about, you know, how perhaps might the color, the lighting, the setting, the costuming, right? all of those different components really collaborate to present us with a specific story world. And you'll hear me say story world throughout the semester as a way of kind of characterizing, you know, what is the universe or world that a creator is able to develop, right? If we think about a story world, oftentimes we might think something like Harry Potter or The Hunger Games or um, Wheel of Time or um, Game of Thrones, right? Something where the creator is able to build out a really kind of full and all-encompassing landscape of sorts in which you can kind of like lose yourself in or kind of really be invested in. Um, how is Halsey attempting to do something kind of similar here? Um, and what are moments in which we see her alone where, and kind of in other cases when she's paired with kind of her um, partner in this video, right? So thinking about, you know, what are moments when the narrator of a particular music video or the main character, depending on kind of the narrative scope, right? Um, when are they alone? When are they paired with someone else? What is their interactivity or connectivity with the other person, right? All of these components are incredibly interesting and important to think about. And then finally, you also had a music video from Madison Beer. Um, Madison Beer is someone who definitely is at kind of the center point of scandal quite often. Um, I think Madison Beer oftentimes gets more kind of public press around whether or not she's had plastic surgery or just kind of cosmetic procedures um, more so than her music career. Um, she definitely, I think when she is in the news, that's kind of the, um, the concentration or kind of when she's trending, that's the concentration, right? Um, we also kind of saw her at the, um, getting a lot of flack during um, this, the uprisings last summer um, when she was kind of posing with a sign at one of the protests. And so she's one of many celebrities who kind of um, has for better or for worse become really well known because of her looks and because of what she posts online and then usually gets a lot of flack for those things. Um, you know, Madison Beer would also be one to kind of think about in terms of how she's publicly spoken about kind of peer pressure or just kind of societal pressure to look a certain way or be a certain way or be perfect um, and how she's held up by some consumers as a standard of perfection. Um, while at the same time, there's kind of a lot of vitriol that comes her way because of the potential for her looks to be manufactured. Um, and so when we think about surveillance, right, something that I look at in my own research, but that is kind of um, really important to contemplate is that when we think about standards of beauty, when we think about standards of perfection, um, a lot of that is organized around this pressure that if one is to, you know, option the idea of getting cosmetic procedures or getting plastic surgery or losing weight or whatever it might be, right? There's a different public tone to those kinds of approaches when one is able to do so without being, um, Kind of called out for doing so and by that i mean when when a celebrity is able to kind of subtly undergo procedures over time 
or subtly able to, you know, lose weight with the help of dietitians and um, coaches and all of these other things, trainers, right? Um, oftentimes the public will be a bit more embracing of those figures if it appears natural, right? If someone can get away with presenting it as like, this is my natural face or this is how I naturally look. Um, they're kind of subtle improvements, quote unquote, um, in their looks are gonna be received very differently than if someone kind of perhaps more obviously or sort of less, um, what's the word I'm looking for? not less obviously, but if somebody is sort of known to be doing these things, right, I immediately think of like Khloe Kardashian is definitely somebody who like has undergone a lot of procedures, definitely her body and just kind of how she presents herself to the world through, you know, filters and Facetune and whatnot, definitely mm -hmm. has a very different response than if she were to able or if she were able mm -hmm. to kind of do these things in a more subtle, gradual way. And I bring all of this up with Madison Beer because I feel that with her, oops, sorry, as my cat is in the background running around, um, you know, with Madison Beer, we can really think about her um, and just kind of what she's saying in her particular music video as a really nice kind of pairing with the Gia Tolentino article in particular, right? Kind of the pressures of maintaining or the pressures of appearing um, to kind of maintain a certain standard, mm -hmm. but that standard being one that sort of there is a lot of pushback if folks catch on that it's not something that's natural or, you know, kind of these accusations of being fake or, you um, not necessarily kind of as legitimate. Um, so with Madison Beer, I elected to give you Dear Society, which was a non-album single released in 2019, namely because I think this text is one in which she really engages with kind of the internet as a whole and social media as a whole. Um, and when we talk about mainstream media, oftentimes we'll see that folks will kind of separate out you know, kind of um, more standard or legacy or traditional media forms like film, television, radio, advertising, those tend to be kind of the big ones that come up in um, kind of just, you know, public dialogue, but also in scholarship um, as being somehow separate from or totally different from the internet or social media. And as we kind of see in the 2010s in particular with the rise of kind of vloggers and influencers, but even as early as the 2000s, as we start to see a pivot to reality TV, um, we can definitely understand that kind of the internet and social media aren't necessarily holistically separate from, you know, what's happening in traditional or mainstream media, right? I would argue that it's an arm of mainstream media. And so when you're watching um, or re-watching Madison Beer's music video, I would encourage you to kind of reflect on mm -hmm. how what some of what she's talking about, you know, how does some of that perhaps um, engage with some of the same themes and topics that we see in the Britney Spears music video from 2000, even though Madison Beer is speaking on these topics 19 years later, right? What are the kind of moments of symmetry? What do they have in common? What is perhaps distinct, right? How does the public as a surveilling body um, perhaps operate differently on the internet than they would by exclusively engaging with a celebrity through the tabloids or through red carpets, right? Um, so all things to be kind of thinking about as you engage with these topics. Now, this is a lengthy lecture intermission. So as a reminder, I, I want you to remember to eat stretch or eat a snack, especially if you're watching this lecture all the way through. I am going to take a quick pause, which on my end will be much longer than kind of the click off um, that you will see on your side, but I will be back momentarily. All right, I am back. Um, I don't know if any of you have pets, but one of my cats, Tiny, um, just now has decided to settle into the clean laundry rather than laying in her bed. And I'm like, of course, um, I feel like I can never escape cat hair. So if you ever see me wiping my face, it's usually because there's cat fur stuck to my nose. And since I wear makeup, of course, um, that combination is not always the best. But anyways, let's go ahead and move into our next section, um, which is the age of Instagram face, which of course is concentrating on Gia Tolentino's New Yorker piece from 2019. Of course, as soon as I say, if I, wa if I wipe my face, it's because I have cat fur on me. And of course I got cat fur in my eye as I say that. <laughs> um, a couple of things I wanted to know. I don't know why this does this. Um, sidebar, whenever I use Google Sides for some strange reason, um, the box that you see right here will show up totally fine when you just view the Google Slides, but in presentation mode, it puts the video over top. I don't know why it does that. And I always forget to um, fix it. So my apologies. But 
I included an optional watch and anytime you see something labeled as an optional watch, it means that you have the option to watch it. Um, and so I try to include links that are potentially useful to you if you're just struggling with a concept or if you're like, I still don't understand what's going on or I need some more context. Um, and so this is an example of such. Um, this is a history of the internet. It's a nice little kind of pocket size approach to understanding, you know, how did the internet happen? Um, this can be a very helpful companion piece if you're like, I am interested in kind of some of these questions or topics about, you know, how social media does its thing. Um, or if you just genuinely are curious about this history, I've included it here for your perusal if useful to you. I totally dislike that Google Slides has also made it that now they do an autoplay for videos and it's so annoying. Um, in addition to providing you with that kind of optional watch video, <clears throat> I've also included for you here just a nice quick snapshot of kind of how social media in particular um, comes into the internet foreground. So with the 19, with 1991, we have the World Wide Web created. Um, and it's really in, like I said, before the 2000s and then the 2010s that we kind of see a rise in just kind of media use changing um, and the public in particular being able to participate so differently um, than they were able to before, right? In the past, if we think about how the public could kind of participate or voice their opinions on celebrities, on fandom, on various things, typically they were turning to message boards or blogs or they were voting in things like, you know, American Idol judging, right? Now, when we have the 2000s, we can kind of think about across the board, we have things like Facebook launching in 2004, YouTube launching in 2005, Twitter launching in 2006, Instagram launching in 2010, Snapchat launching in 2011, Vine launching in 2012, we of course know that did not last long, um, and TikTok launching in 2016, though of course its availability, availability to US consumers is a bit later. Um, but I wanted to just kind of flag for you how we can kind of see this scaffolding of social media apps of course, now we see that many social media apps are kind of purchasing each other, um, meaning that we have more of a conglomerate or more of kind of a um, even monopoly, if you will, of fewer and fewer corporations and, you know, just elite in general owning social media compared to before. But I wanted to really flag for you how kind of each of these platforms, right, comes out at different moments. And as we see with something like YouTube, while it initially launches in 2005, the way that we understand kind of YouTube subcultures and such now don't totally take form until kind of the early to mid 2010s, um, you know, with kind of DIY YouTube, video game YouTube, um, beauty YouTube, so on and so forth, right? And of course, there's plenty of sub communities beyond that. And of course, TikTok has sub communities as well. And so we can understand that each of these apps are being used for different purposes. With Twitter, I think in particular, still kind of retaining a celebrity focused view for its initial kind of existence, though now we see a little bit more of kind of a transition to sub communities. Um, yeah, but definitely celebrities and politicians continue to kind of dominate Twitter as we especially saw in the last presidential. Um, administration. Why couldn't I think of that word? Um, now, this, of course, brings us to Gia Tolentino. And so from her website, I pulled this bio and it reads, Gia Tolentino is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of the essay collection, Trick Mirror. Formerly, she was the de deputy editor at Jezebel and a contributing editor at The Hairpin. She grew up in Texas, went to University of Virginia and got her MFA in fiction from the University of Michigan. She's represented by Amy Williams and recently received a winning award. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times Magazine and Pitchfork, among other places. She lives in Brooklyn. So I wanted to just kind of briefly bring in this bio of Filipina American author Gia Tolentino. Um, Gia Tolentino is really well known for just kind of writing essays and articles about the internet. I apologize in advance. I'm having to <laughs> subtly like Turn my attention to my cat to get the little or one Ferris to get her to stop playing. Um, but yes, Gia Tolentino is somebody who writes about kind of internet culture, um, both in this book, Trick Mirror, but also across kind of her articles online. She's interested in the internet and in reality TV and social media and beauty standards. So she's kind of somebody who's really reflecting on how does society in some respects, organize our behaviors, our interests, right? Um, and how do individuals fit into that? 
And so in her article, which again, I had kind of mentioned, you know, is a bit lengthy, um, but is incredibly useful, I find, for students as we start to talk about something like Instagram as a platform. Um, she kind of opens her article with a personal narrative, right? I want us to kind of throughout the time that we work with secondary sources, be really attentive to form. And if you recall what I mentioned before, we're going to really be thinking about the relationship between content and form consistently across the semester. So if content is the messaging or kind of the argument, perhaps, that the creator is putting forth, form can be understood as the packaging or the way in which this information is presented to the consumer or the viewer, right? So I like to think of it, again, as like, you know, the content is the kind of gift that's inside some kind of um, present bag, present box, right? It's wrapped up in something. Um, I'm so sorry if you can hear my cat playing. Um, and so when we think about content and form, we're thinking about the content as being the messaging, the argument, the statement, the information, and the form is going to be what kind of gift wrap or packaging has this creator selected in order to communicate or convey this information. And so in this case, we have Gia Tolentino opting to, you know, convey this information in article format rather than like in a book or a video, etc. Um, but when we look at an article, we don't want it to escape us that much like looking at a music video, right? There are visual things that are happening here. There are format things that are happening here. There are structural things that are happening here to help us make sense of what she is talking about. So consistently throughout this article, Gia Tolentino is connecting or kind of creating a connective thread between her personal experience and a larger social trend or issue, right? Which she's gonna talk about as the Instagram face. And so she writes at the beginning, this past summer, I booked a plane ticket to Los Angeles with the hope of investigating what seems likely to be one of the oddest legacies of our rapidly expiring decade, the gradual emergence among professionally beautiful women of a single cyborgian face. It's a young face, of course, with poreless skin and plump high cheekbones. It has cat-like eyes and long cartoonish lashes. It has a small, neat nose and full, lush lips. It looks at you coyly but blankly, as if its owner has taken half a clonopin and is considering asking you for a private jet ride to Coachella. The face is distinctly white, but ambiguously ethnic. It suggests a National Geographic composite illustrating what Americans will look like in 2050. If every American of the future were to be a direct descendant of Kim Kardashian West, Bella Hadid, Emily Ratajkowski, and Kendall Jenner, who looks exactly like Emily Ratajkowski. It's like a sexy baby tiger, Kara Craig, a hot in New York colorist, observed to me recently. The celebrity makeup artist Colby Smith told me it's Instagram face, duh. It's like an unrealistic sculpture volume on volume, a face that looks like it's made out of clay. So I wanted to make sure to read this section out loud for you, not only because it's our opening paragraph, but also because I wanted to point to some sort of techniques that Tolentino is using here, right? Um, she's, of course, beginning with kind of this personal narrative or anecdote of you know, booking the um, plane ticket to Los Angeles, right? And so she's starting with, you know, this is gonna be an article that tracks something that I am personally going to investigate. But she also provides us with a definition of this Instagram face term that she's gonna rely on and talk about throughout the article that we of course also see represented in the title of the article. Now, it's important to really pause here and reflect on why she is doing this, right? If someone were to just say to you kind of, um, oh, that's an Instagram face, there is kind of a lot of room for interpretation there, right? In the sense that without a definition kind of provided to us, we're going to rely potentially on personal experience, personal knowledge, um, you know, personal expertise, so on and so forth. Um, but what Tolentino is ensuring is that both someone who engages with Instagram as a platform and someone who does not engage with Instagram as readily or is perhaps not as proficient in navigating the platform are going to understand and be able to recognize the fact that, you know, kind of this is the definition for the look that she is talking about. She's not just assuming that someone's going to know. Um, not only because someone's definition might have slight variations, but also because she's ensuring that everyone's entering into this article with the same point of entry. <clears throat> now, this is a technique that as a writer is very useful and important to do in the introductory section of your work, right? You want to make sure that everyone is coming into your content from a mutual point of entry to ensure that there's sort of less confusion, less pushback potentially, right? It's a way to ensure that we're all kind of, you know, literally and figuratively on the same page. 
She then also kind of gives us some context for Instagram kind of when it was launched. Um, she also talks about having its own aesthetic language, right? Um, and she kind of also goes through a discussion of kind of, um, you know, just kind of how the platform's layout is going to really be beneficial to um, this Instagram base that she's talking about. I also apologize if you can hear the leaf blower in the background. I don't know what it is about my look. Any time of day that I try to record a lecture, sound happens in the background. Um, and then she kind of, you know, goes on to talking about the human body as an unusual sort of Instagram subject. It can be adjusted with the right kind of effort to perform better and better over time. And she really kind of makes connections here between filters and um, kind of this, these cosmetic procedures, right? And I would encourage us to really consider how the overlap between digital manipulation of an image and cosmetic manipulation of an image, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, cosmetic procedures, makeup, costuming, so on and so forth, right, really do go hand in hand. And that you have kind of filters that are built into a platform like Instagram, or you have filters that are available on platforms like Snapchat. Um, and those, of course, are doing work that's comparable in some respects to kind of the physical work that can also happen on an individual's body. However, as Tolentino is really exploring here, the kind of short-term gratification perhaps of you know adding a filter, changing the lighting, um, face tune, and so on and so forth are now also factoring into how people in their day-to-day -day lives are looking at themselves in the mirror and perhaps deciding to pursue a cosmetic procedure, especially as those procedures become more and more um, affordable to the average person. She then pivots to kind of talking about, you know, Beverly Hills as LA's plastic surgery district. I would encourage you to think about setting here for this article. Why is she perhaps um, electing to concentrate on Beverly Hills as her setting? What is unique or significant about this space? Um, how is she perhaps selecting this over another location or region? What is the purpose of that? And how is she using Beverly Hills interwoven with her personal narrative as a way to really explore or perhaps provide evidence for the point or argument that she's trying to make about Instagram? Okay. Now I wanted to include another optional watch here. Um, and this is one that concentrates specifically on filters from Snapchat and kind of, you know, engages with this question of, you know, how contemporary beauty ideals are in fact influenced by, you know, Snapchat filters and people wanting to look like not only a celebrity, but also wanting to look more like their filter or their edited images. Um, and so this is one I encourage you to watch if you have capacity to do so, because it really engages with the same um, questions that we're kind of thinking about across um, Instagram face as an article. Oops. Um, I have another optional watch that I've included here of Is Beauty Culture Hurting Us? Glad you asked. Glad you asked. Wow. Um, from Vox in 2020. This one, it can also be really useful if you find these topics interesting, but especially if you're curious about kind of how this video perhaps can allow for some contextualizing about social media adding to existing discourse about beauty and pop culture, because of course beauty culture on social media isn't invented by social media, right? It's building on existing practices, um, existing industries, and in some ways it's bringing those things together into a more kind of um, central and in some cases more personal space, right? Okay, this is a lengthy lecture intermission. I am going to pause here for a moment. Uh, I encourage you to get a snack or to stretch before we dive into this next part. See you in a second. All right, let's go ahead and dive into Shoshana Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which was published by Public Affairs in 2019. Um, Shoshana Zuboff is a um, professor. I'm not going to dive into the full extent of her bio because as you can see here it's quite lengthy, but I will mention that she is the Charles Edward Wilson Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. She is in fact retired. Um, she joined the faculty in 1981, but that was the position that she held up until her point of retirement. She was one of the first tenured women at the Harvard Business School and the youngest woman to receive an endowed chair. She earned her PhD in social psychology from Harvard University and her BA in philosophy from the University of Chicago. She has been a featured columnist for businessweek.com and for Fast Company Magazine. She is definitely someone who specializes in kind of the topics surrounding surveillance capitalism that is very much her life's work as a researcher and as somebody who is writing kind of um, in some cases, you know, articles for the popular press, if you will. 
Um, and so books by Shoshana Zuboff include In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power from 1988, The Support Economy, Why Corporations Are Failing Individuals, and the next episode of Capitalism in 2002, and then The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power from 2019. So you can see that there's quite a bit of time between each of these texts, and that's in part because these books are incredibly lengthy. Um, I forgot to pull kind of the age of surveillance capitalism from my shelf to show you, but it is about, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those kind of chunky books as I like to think of them as. Um, but across the board, Shoshana Zuboff is really concentrated on the relationship between the corporation and the individual consumer. Um, she's fascinated by kind of capitalism and how that structures our daily lives, but she's especially interested in how all of these things, you know, kind of, um, are influenced by technology in terms of how our digital engagement also shapes our purchasing practices and also shapes our lived experiences. Now in the excerpt I provided for you, um, she definitely talks about Google and she's very interested in kind of how we are encouraged or pushed to behave in certain ways online. So she writes at one point, Google invented and perfected surveillance capitalism in much the same way that a century ago, General Motors invented and perfected managerial capitalism. Google was the pioneer of surveillance capitalism in thought and practice, the deep pocket for research and development, and the trailblazer in experimentation and implementation, but it is no longer the only actor on this path. Surveillance capitalism quickly spread to Facebook and later to Microsoft. Evidence suggests that Amazon has veered in this direction, and it is a constant challenge to Apple, both as an external threat and as a source of internal debate and conflict. So she's giving us quite a bit of context in this, um, but I wanna really concentrate on this passage where she says, surveillance capitalism is no longer confined to the competitive dramas of the large internet company, companies where behavioral futures markets were first aimed at online advertising. Its mechanisms and economic imperatives have become the default model for most internet-based businesses. Eventually, competitive pressure drove expansion into the offline world, where the same foundational mechanisms that expropriate, expropriate your online browsing likes and clicks are trained on your run in the park, breakfast conversation, or hunt for a parking space. Today's prediction products are traded in behavioral futures markets that extend beyond targeted online ads to many other sectors, including insurance, retail, finance, and an ever-widening range of goods and services companies determined to participate in these new and profitable markets. Whether it's a smart home device, what the insurance companies call behavioral underwriting, or any one of thousands of other transactions, we now pay for our own domination. So I want you to really reflect on that sentence. We now pay for our own domination. That comes at the end of her providing these examples of the smart home device, you know, the insurance companies, behavioral underwriting, et cetera, et cetera, right? And sort of, you know, as I was reading this excerpt, um, what came to me, especially when she kind of points out the insurance company's part, is it made me reflect on how um, when I had applied for um, auto insurance, when I moved to, I think it was when I moved here, um, the insurance provider had said to me, you know, oh, if you attach this device to your car, we can monitor your driving um, for X amount of time. And if you kind of demonstrate through this monitoring that you don't get into accidents, you're really safe, you don't hit on the brakes really hard, so on and so forth, um, you would qualify for sort of a discount or a lower rate in your insurance policy. And I remember finding that really fascinating because it was like, oh, you're going to track you know, where I'm going, what I'm doing in essence, as a way to kind of incentivize, um, you know, paying less per month, right? And it was a temporary product, but it was one you had to mail back, they would monitor and assess it, so on and so forth. And of course, I think we can recognize that this approach is not unique, right? We see this coming uh, through in kind of devices you can have in your home, um, especially voice recognition technology. We can recognize that televisions especially have really evolved in the 2010s to now be voice activated in some cases. Um, our relationship to objects have totally changed. But also if we re kind of reflect on when you navigate social media or the internet, what kinds of advertisements are you getting, right? Did you say something, you know, to your friend and then suddenly it's showing up on your phone um, or you do one Google search for something and suddenly you've got an ad for it on Facebook, right? Um, she's really attending to kind of the far reach of corporations and consumerism now that we are operating in a world in which kind of your personal behaviors, your personal interests, right, are really um, of interest to a corporation that wants to modify your behavior in the sense of wanting to really perhaps um, in some respects 
shift you from saying, oh, I wish I could buy this to then actually buying the thing, right? Um, and she really elaborates on, in, on that point um, in some of the kind of additional viewings that I've included in this lecture. Um, and she writes that surveillance capitalism's products and services are not the objects of value exchange. They do not establish constructive producer-consumer reciprocities. Okay, again, they do not establish constructive producer-consumer reciprocities. So if something is reciprocal, right, it means that it's kind of mutually beneficial. And Zuboff is taking the stance that this is not necessarily a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, instead, they are the hooks that lure users into their extractive operations in which our personal experiences are scraped and packaged as the means to others' ends. We are not surveillance capitalism's customers. Although the saying tells us if it's free, then you are the product, that is also incorrect. We are the sources of surveillance capitalism's crucial surplus, the objects of a technologically advanced and increasingly inescapable raw material extraction operation. Surveillance capitalism's actual customers are the enterprises that trade in its markets for future behavior. So what she's telling us here is that the customer is not the individual user that we would typically you know, kind of traditionally assume is indeed the consumer. So, you know, throughout this lecture, I've said, you know, the viewer, the reader, the consumer, right? Zuboff is taking a different stance in this context and saying that the consumer is sort of the corporations, the enterprises, the businesses that are electing to pay for or kind of contribute to, you know, search engine and websites um, configuration of things that are going to put certain ads in front of you, that are going to encourage you to make certain purchasing choices, right? That they are kind of collaborating with these larger partners. And so in essence, they are the customer because they are the one trying to achieve a certain outcome, which is getting you to purchase or, um, you know, utilize a service, not just once, but kind of consistently over time, right? Um, and so she's pointing out the fact that, you know, oftentimes we'll hear if it's free, then you are the product, which has been a way of kind of talking about social media and that social media is free to use. And so some critics have sort of argued that that means you are the product because, you know, if you are using it for free, then the website needs to get something from you that's sellable or marketable, right? But as Zuboff is kind of attending to, we do see a dramatic shift, um, you know, based in her perspective that, you know, what's actually happening is that the enterprise of the corporation becomes the consumer and that kind of the everyday person becomes the source of the material that they need in order to continue thriving. Now, I do heavily encourage you to watch this interview um, with Democracy Now! from 2019 with Shoshana Zuboff. It is 22 minutes and 17 seconds on YouTube. Um, she really, really concentrates on building out this argument a bit more about kind of, as she perceives it, big tech stealing our data. Um, and she, in this particular interview, really elaborates in ways that I think are helpful, um, given that you've only looked at a four page excerpt, right? So you're not getting the full extent of her argument in the hundreds of pages that she's written on this. So I encourage you to pause and watch because this is going to be very helpful, I think, in order to be able to answer the question on this in the process post. Ooh, I hate that autoplay. Oh, no. there we go. Okay. <laughs> and then I have another pause and watch for you that's 16 minutes and 11 seconds. And this is an interview with Fortune magazine in 2019. Um, and she kind of elaborates on the concept of surveillance capitalism, especially if you're having a hard time defining it in your own words. This is a great interview to watch. But she especially also kind of, you know, goes back and forth with the interviewer here in ways that are really interesting. Um, and I encourage you to kind of be attentive to how she's making sure that her concept's not being confused um, or being kind of mis, um, misdefined, mis, what is the word I'm looking for there? Said incorrectly, we'll just say that. <laughs> um, she's very much kind of, um, you know, making sure that the meaning making is clear with this concept that she's working with. <laughs> oh, you gotta love those moments that you can't think of what you're saying. Um, I've also included this pause and watch. This one's optional. It's a 29 minute and 10 second one. In this case, she's talking to a group of students um, with, at the Institute of Art and Ideas in 2019. It's not uncommon for um, scholars to go kind of on a book tour when they're promoting their latest monograph. And so that's really what she's doing here. It's a really interesting um, kind of lecture that she gives and what she's engaging with the students and kind of getting their thoughts. Um, so if you find her interesting, I encourage you to watch this one, but really I impress that the first two are kind of required viewing. And then this one's kind of a, an optional one if you're finding that you're getting really invested in this topic. 
All right, this is another reminder of a lengthy lecture intermission. Reminder, eat a snack, stretch, pause, whatever you wanna do. I'm gonna keep going here because I've taken my pauses myself um, and because my cats are quiet, so I've gotta make use of the moment. So here are concepts to use in pop culture analysis. Taking notes is highly recommended, not only because these concepts are useful and will come back to haunt you, but because you've also gotta apply them in process post number one. All right, the first concept I have for you is distort or distortion. And this is to twist something out of shape. This could occur sonically, visually, physically, etc. So distortion is going to really be about taking something and seeing it warped, changed, you know, looking drastically different than it initially did. It's a process. Um, you can also think of it as an end result, right? You can think of it sometimes as an aesthetic. Um, it's definitely something that is kind of, um, I think, sometimes thought about in relationship with kind of a television set, for example, um, if kind of you're trying to, you know, back in the day, as my partner would say, if you're trying to kind of get to a certain channel and you're only getting kind of this like, you know, noise and then kind of that image you see on the left side, um, but it doesn't have to be a visual process, right? It could happen sonically, that sometimes folks will distort the sound of their voices. Um, you also see this kind of happening in high stakes, but also low stakes situations, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons why somebody would distort or change their voice. Um, you can also kind of see this happening as sort of a lyrical practice or verbal practice as well. I wanted to just kind of point to that in Katy Perry and Skip Marley's Chained to the Rhythm, there's a specific lyric that even says, turn it up, it's your favorite song, dance, dance, dance to the distortion, turn it up, keep it on repeat, stumbling around like a wasted zombie. This uh, excerpt from the chorus of Chained to the Rhythm is incredibly important and useful to look at in terms of what is the central messaging of that text. And I would encourage you to be really attentive to how she's using the term distortion here. What perhaps is she trying to say? What is she conveying? Um, and how does the video perhaps convey or translate this concept into a way that uh, either complicates or extends the impact of the lyric itself, right? And how she's pairing song with distortion. Um, I also just kind of want to note this giant television set in the Chain of the Rhythm musical video is one that has distortion happening. But I would also encourage you to really reflect on Skip Marley's portion of the song, right? He's kind of exiting through or coming through the television set and coming through the distortion. It would be useful to contemplate what is his relationship to the distortion then? What is he representing or symbolizing or embodying? And how is that perhaps engaging with or um, even kind of um, radicalizing, if you will, Katy Perry's own um, just kind of subject position within the narrative of the music video treatment? And again, music video treatment is a way of talking about, you know, how is the creative team um, producing a story world, creating a, you know, setting a tone, a mood, a theme for the video that either complements or complicates the lyrics that we work with from the song. Another term is intertitle. And this is filmed printed text used during the U.S.'s silent film era, which was the 18, which was 1890 to the late 1920s, uh, to communicate what the actors were saying or what was happening on screen. Um, and so generally what would happen is in a film house, you would have somebody playing an organ um, in the corner while folks would come to watch the film. And so the music would kind of be, you know, in tempo with the actions of the scene. And you would see the mouths moving of the actors, but in between sequences, you would see an intertitle such as this that is giving us that kind of verbal context for what is happening. Um, and so the audio that you were getting was exclusively, you know, the sound of the machine kind of running the film, um, as well as kind of the organ player kind of adding the suspense musically, but you were really only getting the script through, um, you know, the body language of the actors, as well as the intertitles that were providing this kind of context. Now, in the 1975's The Sound, you do have intertitles appearing in between sequences, I would encourage you to think about, you know, what might be the benefits of or the purpose of using this technique in the music video. What are they able to add or extend or accomplish by doing so? Does it do something different perhaps than if they weren't there at all, right? What is the function of an intertitle in a music video where we don't hear the, the um, narrator's voice behind singing or beyond singing the lyrics, I should say. Cityscape is an image or view of a city landscape. It is a spatial term in the sense that it has to do with space, right? A physical space, a literal space. Um, it's going to be kind of a very iconic image we see oftentimes in film in particular, but also in television as well. We oftentimes get really big views of the cityscape to kind of give us a sense of where we're located in that particular narrative. 
we have a cityscape in Britney Spears is Lucky, if we look over here. So we want, might want to kind of complicate how that changes the sort of setting of this room that we see her in initially. How does understanding her to be in the center of a cityscape, city, why am I pausing? Or like, why am I stumbling? How does seeing her in the middle of a cityscape, right, um, potentially change these feelings of like isolation or loneliness that we understand her to be experiencing, right? What is the function of showing the cityscape kind of outside of her window? Um, how would this look different if they placed her in the countryside or they had placed her on a studio lot, right? What is what is working here or kind of what's being conveyed here? Another concept for you is distraction something that prevents a person from paying full attention to something or someone else. This is a term that sometimes can feel really simple and not as useful, but when in fact we're thinking about some of these concepts from this week and in later weeks, distraction can sometimes be very political. Uh, it can be very financially motivated, right? If we're thinking back to um, Zuboff's point about kind of surveillance capitalism, wanting to kind of modify our behaviors and push us in a certain direction, being distracted from that actually means we're disconnected from or we're not fulfilling the goals and desires of those corporations and enterprises. And that can actually be something that perhaps is empowering or useful. Um, so distraction is something that we see showing up throughout the music video as something that sort of is, or music videos, I should say, um, that we can understand as being, you know, kind of a behavior or action that is not necessarily always encouraged or rewarded. Ambigu amb ambiguity or ambiguous is a term that means not easy to classify within a singular category or explanation open to multiple interpretations or meanings. I included images of um, Rashida Jones and Jessica Alba here because each of them are um, mixed race women who sometimes depending on who is looking at them can be read a number of different ways. And so we can think about ambiguity as being a racial ambiguity to kind of go back to Gia Tolentino's point that sometimes racial ambiguity or ethnic ambiguity can be leveraged or can be problematized um, or can be kind of turned into an aesthetic. I also included this image of Lady Gaga in her uh, meat dress because the messaging for this was quite ambiguous, that while Lady Gaga was really clear on what it kind of represented, um, a lot of the public thought that it represented, you know, her being anti-meat consumption, when in fact I think it was about her talking about like veterans rights. Um, so sometimes the messaging of a text can be quite ambiguous. The same goes for this dress over here that was famously, you know, one that some people saw as blue and black, others saw as white and gold, and create a lot of questions around the ambiguity of its color scheme. Surveillance, the big term of the week, um, is the close watch or monitoring of an individual or collective by a larger organization or entity. So this is a term that's separate from Shoshana Zuboff's concept can of course be very useful for talking about kind of either lower stakes surveillance or higher stakes surveillance. I've included images here that can kind of, um, you know, just kind of visualize different levels of surveillance that can pop up. Definitely we can think about kind of a top tier surveillance as being one that's by a corporation or a government um, or a police force, whereas a smaller minor um, kind of small scale form of surveillance could be being in a classroom, right? And being expected to behave in a certain order, so on and so forth. Attention economy, this is a really important term. Um, so in the digital age, this term refers to the ways in which a person's ability to focus on something like information, entertainment, or online content is considered a commodity that is limited in scope, but highly desirable and sought after by entities like corporations. So this kind of brings together the Shoshana Zuboff and the Gia Tolentino in a way, um, in that we want to really think about social media use and just online use, online shopping would fit nicely here, right, into this attention economy concept. Um, so your focus, your ability to kind of put your attention on something becomes something incredibly desirable to entities that are trying to sell you something in politics, in um, retail, in what else? social media just to keep using it right <laughs> I mean it's really about like your attention is like the thing that is desired to kind of keep you concentrated on something for long periods of time um, and again it's another example of modified behavior I included a kind of excerpt here from Jenny Odell's how to do nothing 
um, Jenny O'Dell really talks about kind of attention as something that is precious and overdrawn as a resource, um, and that we kind of have to think very strategically about how we're using our concentration and focus. Who are we giving it to? What are we giving it to? Um, and that's a political choice, she argues, um, because when we're giving more or less of our attention to something, um, different entities or kind of enterprises are able to benefit from or exploit that attention. Um, and so I encourage you to kind of look at this excerpt um, from the back cover of her book because it is an incredibly useful way of thinking about um, kind of this text of how to do nothing resisting the attention economy. Um, and you'll notice many of these texts are from the same period of time. Many of them were published in 2019 um, in terms of kind of secondary texts that we're looking at today, um, which kind of also helps to emphasize how in the late 2010s, folks' relationship to social media and the internet kind of changes in tone as folks become more aware of kind of what corporations are seeking to do. I ask that you pause and watch this video in preparation for process post number one, which is the attention economy, how they addict us. There is a question in process post number one about this video specifically, and I want you to be attentive to these strategies and techniques that Will Schroeder uses to make his point. Again, it's not about agreeing or disagreeing, it's about recognizing the strategies a creator uses to try to convince or compel their reader or consumer to believe or accept their argument. And then protest, a fight or pushback against a larger entity or system by an individual or a collective. Um, this may take the form of refusal, social justice actions, violence, or digital campaigns, among others. I've included here um, kind of infographics and a past social media post, um, you know, just to kind of show examples of how local actions participate in this kind of protest work. We can also think other, of other examples of protest as being kind of an individual in a certain social situation, deciding they don't want to do something, right? Oftentimes when we think about protest, it's kind of a larger scale public demonstration of some kind, but it doesn't necessarily exclusively have to consist of that. It can be symbolic, it could be um, figurative, it can be literal, it can be sustained, it can be short-term, it can be long-term, right? This is a term that I encourage you to really reflect on because it can be quite useful for articulating how an individual's relationship to the system may be positive, negative, or kind of nuanced, okay? That is everything I have for you today in English 1110. I hope that this was helpful for you. I know it is quite a bit of information, but my hope is that it kind of helps you to make sense of, you know, how the primary sources and the secondary sources for this week are collaborating to help us understand this topic of surveillance capitalism. If you are panicking, if you're having a hard time, if you're just like, I don't know what's going on, I have office hours on Mondays from 11 o'clock a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern, and I'm happy to talk through readings or viewings with you or assignment prompts. Um, if that time does not work for you, I'm happy to meet with you at an alternate time. I do wanna note that next week, yes, next week, not this week, but next week, I'm getting my second vaccine shot. So there will be a couple days that I will be just down and out because I tend to be the person who always has reactions to things. So I'm definitely very available this week, still available, but not as available next week. Um, so if you have questions, thoughts, concerns, et cetera, also feel free to email me or call me, all of those are fine. Call me exclusively during office hours, email me whenever. I'm most consistently gonna to respond to email on Mondays because that's when I'm in front of the computer for the longest amount of time, um, but I will get back to you at kind of the you know, soonest rate that I can. But I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying this class so far and I hope you have a good rest of your week and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. All right, everyone, take care, bye.